Happy homecoming. Uh, my name is Josh Grill. I am an Alzheimer's disease researcher here at UC Irvine. I'm on the faculty in the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine and in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior in the School of Biological Sciences. I'm going to present a lecture to you this afternoon on the neuroscience of music and dementia. And we have exactly one hour with a very hard stop. So I am going to jump right in. And on the next slide, you'll see what I hope to do in this one hour, um, if possible, leaving some time for questions, which is my favorite part of giving lectures. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the neuroscience of music. I'm gonna talk about the role of music in brain disease, and I'll conclude with um, my beliefs about the role of music in, in dementia, my particular area of study. So on the next slide, I show you a photo of a bone flute. This is uh, a, a flute from the radius bone of a, of a vulture um, that has been carbon dated, placing it back uh, more than 35,000 years ago. And this was around the time when human beings were just uh, uh, committing to agriculture and making other modern human advances. And it shows um, quite compellingly that, that music has been with us as a species for a long time, as long as, as we can really understand, as long as history allows us to understand, uh, music has been fundamental to, to human culture and, and way of life. And on the next slide, you see that um, you know, we, can, we can realize that music is with us in numerous ways. It's, it's ubiquitous to our human societies. Every culture has music and, and dance. Uh, obviously, these, the form of music has taken many, many shapes or styles, but it is, it is fundamental to essentially every uh, aspect of, of human life, uh, every, every different human culture. It's, it's useful. Um, armies march to music. Athletes can train to music. You may have determined or discovered other ways that you can use music to be more effective or um, efficient or, or successful in your own life. And, and, and key to today's lecture, it's incredibly powerful. Music is, is associated with strong emotions in many people. And, and this is almost certainly why Music has persisted through evolution and through our, our early beginnings as a species into our, our modern times. Next slide. So this is um, taken from literally uh, a textbook from my graduate training in neuroscience. It, it's the pathway by which sound information enters the brain. Uh, obviously, this is, is through the ear. Uh, it's transduced into an electrical sim signal that is carried up through nerves into the brainstem and ultimately into what we call the primary auditory cortex. Uh, on the next slide, you know, there's a, a cartoon that shows from there, sound information can travel to other areas of the brain from this, this primary uh, sensory cortex and what's called Heschel's gyrus, where we interpret auditory information. Um, but music actually seems to activate the brain differently than does sound. And on the next slide, I summarize uh, with an image from a very nice couple of review articles how different parts of the brain seem to be involved in different aspects of, of hearing, interpreting, perhaps even enjoying and responding to music. And, and you begin to get a sense that music... Um, has a distributed network of the brain that it actually can can activate, and this is this is different from from uh, other sounds. And on the next slide, I show some imaging data. This is actually imaging data from uh, infants, showing that the way that music activates the brain is seemingly inborn in us. We don't we don't learn this as as young adults or or even as children. Uh, essentially from birth, our brain is wired to respond differently to music 
compared to other sounds. A, a, a more bihemispheric, meaning both um, uh, sides of the brain can be activated, a more distributed network, uh, which is what's shown here. Um, I can't point uh, with the mouse, but you can see in the top row of this figure, the orange area representing the area of the brain activated by music is, is much larger, even in infants, compared to a series of sounds that are controlled for, for volume uh, and, and duration and the like, um, but aren't musical in nature. Uh, in fact, on the next slide, um, I'll begin to show you uh, data from, I believe, the most uh, uh, prominent researcher in the area of the neuroscience of music, uh, Robert Zatori at the Montreal Neurological Institute uh, and his group. And um, we're gonna uh, play uh, some music for you right now, um, which is similar to what was used in that previous slide and used in, in the current slide. First, you'll hear, I hope, some piano music. I don't know if you guys are hearing the music. I am not. I, I hope that you are. Um, but what you should be hearing is what we would consider first consonant music, um, music that is um, in, I, 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 I see one chat saying, nope, not hearing it. So we'll try to fix that because music is important to this talk. Um, and I'll explain what you're seeing on the slide. Um, we, we were going to play some piano music that's first consonant and then dissonant, meaning that first the, the, the music is in sync and um, consistent. Um, then it's followed by uh, dissonant music that is out of sync and, and almost amusical. And Zatori put people in the scanner um, while they were hearing these two different uh, forms of of sound, uh, consonant and dissonant music, and showed that these two highly matched uh, uh, forms of sound really differentially activated the brain. And um, the, the data that's presented in the slide show um, a couple of things. First, on the left, I don't know if you guys lost your slide there as well, but uh, what we were seeing on the left was uh, ratings by the participants in this study of the pleasure related to the music. And as you might uh, have concluded yourself, the more uh, dissonant the music, the less pleasurable it was to people in the study. Um, the more consonant the music was, the more pleasurable it was. And that the brain di differentially responded as well, uh, highly concordant with these, with these measurements. And in fact, um, Zatori very early on, and this actually dates back to last century, um, recognized that it was the reward, reward circuitry and the pleasure circuitry of the brain uh, that seemed to be responded positively to music. Okay, on the next slide, um, one, of my, one of my favorite uh, favorite studies of all time. Zatori had, had shown that the reward circuitry of the brain could, could be activated by listening to music and then he asked a very unique question. And I love giving this talk in person so I can ask people to raise their hands. But he, he found a collection of highly trained musicians for whom they had a particular piece of music that reliably invoked in them a unique response. Um, what, what we sometimes refer to as hair uh, standing up on the back of your neck, giving you the chills. He put people in the brain scanner and played pieces of music that consistently, quote unquote, gave them the chills. And he, he measured other things to confirm the physiologic response that people had to this music with galvanic skin responses, asking them how pleasurable the music and the like. And I think the other thing that's truly brilliant about this study is the control group. The, tr the control group in this study was not mixing up the sounds to control for, for volume. It was listening to the pieces of music that raised the hair on the back of neck of the neck of other classically trained musicians. And most of the people in this study were classically trained musicians. And um, the, the brain scan that was used was uh, something called a PET scan where he could look at different regions of the brain that were responding, being activated uh, as people actually 
experienced the chills by, by measuring these physiological responses while they were in the scanner. And, and basically, again, what he found was that when people experienced this, um, this, this extreme intense pleasure in, in relation to, to music, it was differentially activating their brain, differentially activating these reward circuitries, parts of the brain that um, are what we refer to as dopaminergic. Um, they, they, they respond to things that we want to uh, experience again. And so, you know, uh, sex, uh, uh, food in some cases, um, chocolate can cause dopaminergic release in some of these brain regions. Uh, these are the parts of the brain that um, were lighting up when people had this intensely pleasurable experience hearing hearing music that they knew. Uh, next slide. So um, Zatori and other labs went on to really confirm this finding, and this is um, maybe more science than we need, but fMRI compared to PET scan gives the opportunity to look at um, more more uh, detailed neuroanatomical structures, and and Zatori showed that striatal um, uh, structures, including the nucleus accumbens and the caudate striatum, were uh, responding and being activated uh, to to hearing pleasurable music. A specific type of PET scan study showed that dopamine was the um, was was involved in this process. It didn't exclude other neurotransmitters from being involved, but it uh, a particular uh, dopamine PET study confirmed that um, that this was a neurotransmitter that was part and parcel what was with what was seeing was being seen in the brain. And on the next slide, I think one, a really additional important thing. Uh, he went on to do a study not in classically trained musicians, but in, in just young people in the, in the Montreal area. Um, so he, he, he next uh, put together this incredible study of people who were, who were young, they might, might be into music, but they weren't classically trained. They weren't even musicians in most cases. They were college kids at McGill and, and other schools around the Montreal area. And they played music um, from the sort of tech and alternative mu music genres that were popular in that era. Um, but they played uh, music from the bands listed here, um, all of which were new to the people who participated in the study. So all of this music was, was new. They had never heard it before. And um, what they found uh, in the next slide is that, oh, and I forgot to say, what, they put people in the scanner, um, they played these new pieces of music to them, and they asked them when they heard the music, how much would you be willing to pay on a music sharing uh, uh, platform like iTunes or, or another platform like that? How much would you be willing to pay for this song, which you've never heard before? And the choices were, were $2, $1.29, $1, or $0. And what you can see, our data that in science would be suspect because they're so perfect that we rarely see data like this. What you can see is that the, the activation of this particular part of the brain involved in the reward circuitry that we call the nucleus accumbens, um, the activation was, was a near perfect correlation. The more activation you got, the more a person was willing to pay for that song. And if there was no activation, they weren't willing to pay anything. And I probably have phrased that the, in the wrong order. If, if they weren't, if it wasn't activating the nucleus accumbens, they didn't want to pay for it because they didn't enjoy it. It didn't elicit uh, pleasure in those individuals. So there's a tight correlation between the brain's activation of this circuitry and how much we enjoy music. And this happens in everyone. It, you don't have to be a classically trained musician to have music activate your brain in a way that is reinforced and rewarded by our brain's circuitry and chemistry. And I think that this is, this is incredible and, and really important. Next slide. So now I'm going to transition and talk a little bit about music and brain disease. I've talked about music and, and the healthy brain. Now I'm going to talk about music and brain disease. And, and here too, there's a fascinating literature for us to consider. So I'm going to begin with a little bit more music, I hope. On the next slide, we'll play brief 
snippets from two pieces of music and I couldn't hear the last one. So um, this could get challenging, but let's give it a try. Okay. Okay, so um, the the generally, you know, we would do a show of hands, or I might even call on the audience to say, what do these two pieces of music have in common? Go ahead and think about it. I'll tell you, the first one was the Dooley's. That was a UK pop band. That song was released in 1977. People are answering. That's wonderful. Uh, it peaked in the UK charts at number 13. The second song was uh, Sean Paul. It's called Temperature. It was released in 2006. And um, it actually won a Grammy for Dance Song of the Year that year. And people had uh, great answers. Uh, both songs made them want to dance. Great. A absolutely. Um, but getting back to our theme of brain disease, um, those are actually two songs documented in the medical literature as having caused seizures in people with musicogenic epilepsy. So let's go to the next slide. Um, musicogenic, uh, musicogenic epilepsy is, is a real condition. It is thankfully extremely rare, um, but it is documented in the literature um, it is real. Um, Stacy Gale, who's pictured here with her neurosurgeon in Long Island, um, is a good example of a person who uh, experienced musicogenic epilepsy. Um, interestingly, we don't really know a lot about why this happens. Um, it does happen more often in women than men, um, typically young women, in fact. Um, and Stacy Gale, uh, during her college years, I believe she was Canadian and she was living in the New York uh, area as a student and she began to um, do really poorly in school and she, it was because she began having seizures and she was having um, absence seizures and they actually uh, were, were at first uh, sparked by hearing the song Temperature by Sean Paul. And I said that, that song won a Grammy. It was a song that was ubiquitous in the culture of the day uh, in, in the circles in which she was running. And her musicogenic epilepsy actually expanded to include other hip hop songs. Um, Rihanna's uh, Umbrella um, was one that she uh, noted. Um, and she ended up seeking treatment. Uh, she went into a, a seizure unit to be to undergo studies um, where they, you know, they use high density EEG. They keep people um, for monitoring for long periods of time. Um, when she was in the unit, um, they, they ran across a problem. She wasn't having seizures, and so it was really hard to study her seizures. They they uh, stopped her medications. They kind of deprived her of sleep for a while. They were trying to actually get her to have a seizure to help understand what was going on. And eventually she said, you know what, just hand me my, my phone or my purse. Um, and she wanted to play some music because she knew that she could give herself a seizure. This was, this was debilita debilitating to her. It was, it was enough to make her um, consider quitting school and, and moving back to her hometown. Um, but ultimately um, she was um, essentially corrected through a neuros neurosurgical procedure. Um, and all the cases that are documented in the literature, and the vast majority of them, I should say, this is a temporal lobe epilepsy. It's a limbic uh, side of the brain phenomenon. Um, the parts of the brain that are important to um, emotion and memory. Um, and um, it's often for uh, music that a person actually genuinely enjoys um, um, and has an emotional response to. Um, so an unfortunate example of how uh, music can, can impact the brain. Um, on the next slide, uh, uh, an incredible case um, from a book uh, and a series of papers um, by Dr. Oliver Sacks, a, a world famous uh, author and neurologist um, who, who passed sadly just a couple years ago. Um, musicophilia, uh, an insatiable craving of music in his book of the same title, which I, I highly recommend to people interested in this topic. Um, a, a surgeon 
who was vacationing with his family uh, many years ago. Um, he was up in the, uh, the lakes of northern New York, if I remember correctly. He, to give you a sense of the time, he went to use a payphone, a local payphone, to make a call um, and was walking across a parking lot when he was struck by lightning. He woke up uh, after being unconscious, laying on the parking lot ground to a nurse who had revived him. And he said, it's OK, I'm a doctor. And she said, you weren't two minutes ago. Um, he, he seemed to be OK. He, he had uh, burns from where the uh, lightning exited his feet. Um, but otherwise, no immediate sequelae of having been struck by lightning. Uh, he went for a full cardiac workup, neurological workup. Everything seemed more or less normal. When he returned to his life uh, with his family as a surgeon, um, he began waking in the middle of the night with um, the desire to hear classical music. That gave way to um, a desire to, to play piano. He, he had to buy a piano. He, he craved playing piano so much that um, he bought a piano and put it in his house. He went on to want to try to compose his own music. And he had, um, uh, you know, taken piano lessons and played piano as a child. But this was, this was abrupt and new. Um, and this became so compulsive that he, he ultimately, um, he actually ended up like divorcing his wife. He, he worked to, to satisfy his means, but all he really wanted to do was play and compose classical music and became of some renowned among amateur uh, 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 classical music composers. Um, and, you know, what did that bolt of lightning do to, to his brain? Um, we frankly uh, just don't know. Um, but this type of effect has been shown in, in other patients in the literature, including um, uh, some epilepsy patients, again, getting to this part, particular part of the brain that seems to be involved in, in the emotional response to music, perhaps even driving, in some cases, uh, compulsive behaviors. Next slide. Go ahead. So um, thankfully, it's not all bad. Um, we can also think about um, uh, music as a treatment. And there are uh, a lot of uh, interesting writings and, and studies around whether music can, for example, help alleviate pain uh, or um, uh, other aspects of um, uh, using music as an intervention. And some really neat studies to suggest that if music is used as a treatment, um, we, we might need less analgesics or, or post-surgical uh, pain medicines, for example. Uh, and I'm sure you uh, have used music in your own life, perhaps, uh, to help you um, recover from, from, from uh, emotional or even um, physical, physical maladies. Next slide. So um, I love this example from the neurology literature. Dates back to 1979, uh, famous neurological journal of a patient with Parkinson's disease. For those who don't know, Parkinson's disease is what we call a movement disorder. These patients developing develop a, a worsening uh, over time progressive uh, problem with movement, including shuffling gait and, and eventually even things like freezing uh, an inability to move at all. And this is a case of a man who um, had Parkinson's disease. I think he, he was in fact a neurologist himself, if I remember correctly, uh, who, who had freezing behavior, um, but his radio was on and he couldn't move until suddenly a Sousa march came on the radio and that that music and the march uh, actually propelled him out of his dystonic uh, freeze. Um, if only, uh, and I, I have the quote here, uh, that he from that point forward decided to try to carry uh, or have music available to him um, so that if this ever happened again, he'd be prepared to propel himself out of, out of his frozen state. If only we had modern devices that let us carry music on our person in an easy way. Oh, goodness. Okay, next slide. Um, a couple of other uh, really incredible therapeutic uses of, of, of music. Um, this is uh, Gabby Gifford. Uh, the, the Arizona 
a member of Congress who was who was very sadly uh, shot at a rally um, uh, for her own reelection campaign, if I remember correctly. Um, she experienced uh, brain trauma um, um, that robbed her of her ability to speak. Um, we think of the left side of the brain as being uh, involved in in speech. Um, and if people suffer brain trauma or have a left hemisphere brain stroke, they often are, are le uh, uh, impaired in their ability to to form words and, and produce language. Um, Gottfried Schlag, a neurologist at Harvard, developed what he calls melodic intonation therapy um, and has, has produced some incredible studies in the literature in, in left hemisphere stroke patients, but Gabby Gifford also benefited from this therapy. People who have left hemisphere brain damage and, and <coughs> lose the ability to speak are, are genuinely surprised to learn that when asked, they can still sing in many cases. And so if you ask them to sing something simple like happy birthday, um, this, uh, this is something they can still do despite their inability to speak. And Schlaug developed a procedure, a, a therapeutic approach of um, helping people understand this, that they, that they can still sing even though they can no longer speak. Um, and then teaching them to replace the words of common songs like happy birthday with other useful phrases and then slowly removing the melodic component of the music so that only the words are left. And, and what's basically happening is song is um, a right hemisphere function in the brain and he is teaching people to use their right hemisphere to speak um, in the absence of uh, their functioning left hemisphere uh, verbal areas of the brain. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And then the next slide, there's um, just a quick image of how the brain may actually rewire as a function of some of this, uh, 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 as a function of this treatment, um, the connections between the right hemisphere and other parts of the brain actually grow uh, in size and number, and that may be how people actually uh, relearn to speak. Okay, I'm gonna turn now uh, to, to music and memory, um, and I'm gonna show a, a quick TV clip if we can get that to work uh, as we turn our attention. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Now, Sam, you can learn about anything in this world if you just follow my little trick. Got it? Mm -hmm. All right, Albania. Here, Albania. Or should we say Albania? <laughs> Why'd you say it like that? We learn our facts by associating countries with music. Why? Do uh, you want to study alone? No, no. Uh, look. No. One, two, three. Albania, Albania, you border on the Adriatic. Your land is most mountainous and your chief export is chrome no okay we can Republic. stop it there so i hope everybody uh well it not perhaps not everyone is familiar with that show uh that's the show cheers one i grew up with and and loved dearly um and the the backstory there is that those two characters sam and coach are former major league baseball players who are going back to school to get their their uh high school diplomas and um and coach um who is a wonderful character um big hearted um but rarely accused of being uh, the smartest person in the bar um is tr tremendously outperforming sam the good looking bartender owner um, in in their school and uh, the backdrop is that Sam is under trying to understand why coach is doing so much better in school than he is and coach takes him under his wing to teach him his study habits which as you saw uh, is basically to take all information he's responsible to learn um, and putting it to song 
and this is, I, I assume, foreign to no one. Uh, anyone who has children has taught them the ABCs, and rarely do we do that in the absence of melody. Um, so, you know, I think that this is a, a, an easy concept, concept for us to understand that, that music and memory can, can often go together. But how far can we go with this? Can we, can we use music to improve our memory? Certainly we can, we can use it as a mnemonic to help us remember a list of things or a, a, a series of information, but, but can music actually make us smarter, or improve our performance on memory tests? UCI was actually home to a study several decades ago in the early 1990s of what was called the Mozart effect. Um, could listening to classical music help students perform better on standardized tests? This made a lot of uh, headlines that listening to, to Mozart or other classical music might actually help students do better on their SATs and other entrance exams. And it was actually um, uh, so uh, impactful that uh, it was, there were efforts to replicate this even in, in mice. Um, playing classical music in the in the room that housed the cages to see if mice perform better on um, mazes and other uh, behavioral tasks. I think that uh, for the most part, this has been um, mostly uh, maybe not debunked, but mo we've moved on as a field from this notion. Um, but still, I think that there there may be a role for for music as we think about memory. And in the chat, I even saw the title of a film, Music and Memory. And of course, there's, there's no um, more important area of medicine in which music, uh, in which memory is a key than, than Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So I'll spend the remainder of the time, uh, and we can go to the next slide, talking about um, music and, and dementia. Thanks, Charlie. You can go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, so so what is dementia? Um, dementia is a is a syndrome. It means that a a person has problems with thinking, and memory is a, a form of a, a thinking skill or a domain of cognition that is uh, most synonymous with dementia. But there are others that are important. We've already talked about language, um, decision making, and judgment, reasoning. Um, you know, we could talk about being able to take information from our, uh, our peripheral and, and incorporating it into our brain, what we might call visual spatial function. But when a person has thinking problems that prevent them from living life the way they once did, they meet the criteria for dementia. And there are some forms of dementia that are actually quite treatable. Um, sometimes people are taking too many medications or medications are interacting in a way that we would prefer they didn't. And taking away the medications may actually help a person's memory uh, so much so that they that they can live life the way they did before they started taking the medications. Other people may have severe dehydration or hormone imbalances that can be treated and they're, they were once met the criteria for dementia and no longer do. Unfortunately, those um, instances are somewhat rare, and the majority of people who meet the criteria for dementia suffer from a, a neurological condition or, more often than not, a, a neurodegenerative disease. And, and on the next slide, um, I kind of illustrate this idea that dementia is an umbrella term, and under the umbrella of dementia, there are many diseases that can uh, affect the brain in a progressive way. Um, whereby a person has problems in thinking that prevent them from living life independently. And um, um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these, although uh, some of them may appear again later in slides for their interesting um, aspects as it relates to, to music. Um, but but on the, ne the next slide, I show you that the overwhelming most frequent cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. I'm 60 to 70 percent of people who who meet the criteria for dementia suffer from a, a brain disease um, whereby they have accumulations of abnormal proteins in the brain called plaques and tangles um, that are um, robbing them of their, of their memory performance and other cognitive skills, leaving them dependent upon others to live life, though, uh, independent, uh, to live life. And so they're dependent on others. They are no longer independent 
uh, they meet the criteria for dementia, but Alzheimer's disease is, is what's causing um, uh, their, their clinical presentation. Now, in dementias and in Alzheimer's disease in particular, next slide, um, we, we think of progressive changes. Uh, a person um, really can't remember the way they once did. They can't plan a party the way they once did. They may not be able to function you know, as a volunteer or, or um, you know, certainly perform in their job if they're still working the way they, they did before. But their ability to um, appreciate and enjoy and even perform music may remain intact until very, very late in the disease. And, and this is, is documented in the medical literature. Um, here is you know, a case from the literature of an individual, 71. He, he was um, mildly to moderately uh, impaired in, in his disease, but you know, couldn't tie his own necktie anymore, but he could still perform. In a um, in a Dixieland band, um, I don't know if people have ever heard of the the memory tapes. Uh, this was an HBO docu series produced by Maria Shriver. Some of it filmed right here at UCI many many years ago. It was award winning. Um, it followed a number of really fascinating cases, including a gentleman who um, his dementia progressed so much that he had to be placed in a skilled nursing facility. Um, his family visited him routinely. His wife actually uh, had to learn that he he had taken a new girlfriend um, in the facility, um, which she was okay with, which is a whole nother lecture about the amazing abilities of caregivers. Um, but he was still traveling in a choir um, and remembered all the words to the songs um, and even took solos despite being so severe in his neurodegenerative disease, he couldn't live at home any longer. And um, I've been interested in music for many years. Uh, I've begun a couple programs at different places and um, some of them generated some attention. And, and one thing that started happening is people started sharing their own uh, musical stories with me. And I'm gonna share one with you now on the next slide. My dad has Alzheimer's disease. He's 79 years old. It's been about 20 years since he last played the drums, but I still wanted to give it a try. Ten minutes after making this video, he had no memory of our performance together. But yet, he can still make music like this. I wonder why. So I think that's a remarkable video uh, for a number of reasons. I think they're both actually fantastic uh, performing. That was literally their first, uh, if you will, rehearsal. Um, first time that, that her dad had been given you know, a set of drums and drumsticks. And, and it, it was like he hadn't missed a, a day of practice. It was still there. And the reason is that it was still there. Um, I think this uh, uh, figure is, is incredible. Um, in the very top, uh, you see a red region um, based on a large number of healthy, normal people who were um, put in a scanner and asked about, um, uh, uh, played old music familiar to them. And this is the part of the brain that, that reacted to hearing um, uh, well-known uh, familiar music. And what's below that is, is maps of the brain um, and the changes that occur in Alzheimer's disease. And so in the second row, it's a heat map of where the brain actually shrinks or atrophies in, in response to Alzheimer's disease. So the yellow and green and uh, red regions are where we see shrinkage in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. And you can see no overlap with the part of the brain that uh, responds to familiar music. The third one is hypometabolism. So it's looking at how active the brain is. Again, we see characteristic changes uh, in reduced brain metabolism in Alzheimer's disease. No overlap with those regions 
associated with recognizing familiar music. And then lastly, a map of the brain and where the plaques uh, that are synonymous with Alzheimer's disease deposit and accumulate through the course of this disease. And again, essentially no overlap between the, the, the parts of the brain that recognize familiar music and the parts of the brain that have the most significant deposition of beta amyloid plaques through the course of Alzheimer's disease. And so, you know, it's, it's with looking at data like this, perhaps it should not be surprising that patients with dementia have, uh, even until late stages of the disease, a profound ability to continue to appreciate and even perform music. Next slide. So can we harness this ability somehow and, and use music to treat patients uh, with dementia? Um, and, and it's a complicated question. And though there are a lot of papers in the literature about music as an intervention, uh, it is a, a far from perfect literature. Um, the, the rigorous uh, method for studying any intervention is what we call clinical trials. And in particular, uh, rigorous clinical trials are double blind, placebo controlled and randomized in their designs. And, and there are simply very few gold standard clinical trials of music as an intervention for people with dementia. Um, so that makes it pretty difficult to make um, strong conclusions. But I will say that, um, you know, my personal reading of this literature is that, that there is inadequate evidence to suggest that music can actually help patients with Alzheimer's disease do better on cognitive tasks. Uh, next slide. Uh, um, the studies that are available are, are challenging. Um, control groups for music interventions are, are difficult to develop. Um, so what do you actually compare music to? Do you compare it to that dissonant piano, um, or, or do you compare it to standard of care, et cetera? Um, and you know, which patients do you study is, is a critical question in any clinical trial, and, and what are the potential confounds that could make it difficult, uh, that could impact your study? These are all uh, really key um, design questions that, that um, you know, a lot of the studies that are available in the literature have struggled, struggled to answer. Next slide. So again, very few studies uh, around, rigorous studies around whether music can actually improve cognition uh, in people with Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. The ones that exist are, are, are frequently flawed um, using less than sensitive instruments or making mistakes around design to, you know, for example, have 10 different cognitive tasks as an outcome measure, and then concluding that because one showed a benefit, that music was a successful intervention. Um, we, we just need more rigorous studies, um, but the best studies that are out there have actually failed to find a benefit uh, for music in, in improving memory or other cognitive skills uh, for people with dementia. Next slide. That doesn't mean that music isn't helpful for people with Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. And I would argue that maybe cognition isn't the right target um, to use music as an intervention. And I think, uh, and what I'll leave you with, is that the, the, the strongest evidence and the most exciting opportunity for music as a treatment for people with dementia is to improve what we call behavioral symptoms. Behavioral symptoms occur in essentially 99% of people with dementia at some point in their disease. Um, they are challenging symptoms like apathy and worse agitation and aggression. Um, they are extremely distressing to family members who are caring for a loved one with disease. There are no FDA approved treatments for these symptoms and the treatments that are used carry black box warning for sudden cardiac death. Non-pharmacologic interventions are, should be and are the first line therapies for treating behavioral symptoms. And this is where I think music could have its greatest impact. Next slide. Um, so there are a lot of good approaches that uh, people who are caring for a loved one with dementia should know. Um, there are triggers that often uh, uh, stimulate behavioral symptoms and avoiding those things. 
making sure a person is is living a, an active life, uh, getting good sleep, getting physical activity. Um, those are all key things that every person caring for a loved one with dementia who is dealing with behavioral symptoms should try. Next slide. Um, and I think music is, is a non-pharmacological intervention that should be tried uh, as well. Um, there are a lot of different ways that music might help. Um, you know, it, 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 it's used in group settings in many cases. Uh, there's, there's studies of, of singing lessons in a group. There's studies of music uh, group interventions with tambourines and drums and other instruments. Um, so there's, there's a social aspect. Um, many people use music to remind their loved one of happier days or just happy days. Um, and, and often the, those memories are, are the, uh, the ones that go last in Alzheimer's disease. And so that, that reminiscence approach can be helpful. Um, you know, the, the act of singing is a form of exercise unto itself. Um, music may actually decrease stress hormones in some people, especially if the music is, is pleasurable or soothing. Um, and, and, you know, it may have direct effects on the brain as well, as I've kind of alluded to throughout this talk. Next slide. Um, the neurobiology of why these symptoms occur is still under study. There are multiple hypotheses for this. Um, and, and I won't claim to really uh, be an expert in these uh, different theories of why behavioral symptoms occur. But I will say that one of the um, predominant theories around behavioral symptoms is what's known as a monoaminergic hypothesis. Uh, and that is that uh, certain brain regions involved in particular chemicals, including dopamine, which we began the talk with, um, may be critical to the occurrence of behavioral symptoms. Next slide. And um, we've learned that um, depending on the regions of the brain that are affected in, in um, the disease, it may have a dramatic impact on what music does uh, for those particular patients. So patients with uh, behavioral variant frontotemporal lobar degeneration, a younger onset, um, more uh, polarized degeneration of the front parts of the brain, um, where patients have disinhibition and changes in behavior and decision making as a, a first presenting symptom in most cases, those patients, um, they have a profound impact on their ability to recognize emotional aspects of music, for example. Um, so they may not benefit the same way that a person with Alzheimer's disease could from a musical intervention, because as I showed you, the parts of the brain involved in musical memory may remain intact in Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of reason to wonder about specific neurobiological substrates of music as potential roles for intervention in people with dementia and, and a more precise approach. Next slide. Um, again, I don't wanna get into this too much, but this is um, looking at those specific parts of the brain, including the nucleus accumbens and the striatum and the reward circuitry of the brain and the amount of degeneration in Alzheimer's disease versus other forms of dementia. And the point of this slide is to say that in Alzheimer's disease, um, though there appeared to be sort of a numerical trend, the statistically the, the size of these brain structures was no different um, from a healthy older controls. Whereas we saw atrophy or the investigators who performed this study saw atrophy in behavioral variant FTD uh, and in um, semantic dementia, but not in Alzheimer's disease. All the more reason to think about music as a potential intervention for these patients. Next slide. So um, again, you know, people started telling me stories and probably the, the most common story I heard, and I might've even seen one in the chat box here, um, is that, you know, when we started talking about the role of music in, in, in Alzheimer's disease and others were doing it louder and better than I was, um, people started telling me stories about how music had helped their family members. And, and the most common story was that, you know, their loved one was in the nursing home and the, the staff of the nursing home would would say that, you know, your mom's always difficult, but then after you come visit, and and the, the person would tell me after they would play music um, for their parent, um, they were so much easier to handle and they had so many fewer behavioral symptoms. So some, it's pure anecdote, but really um, um, consistently <laughs> received anecdotes all along the same lines. Next slide. And there are a handful of studies that have tried to look at this in a controlled manner. 
Um, this is one that randomized actual wings of nursing homes to, to personalize music interventions compared to just piping sort of, if you will, elevator music to the whole wing. And they found that when people had personalized music interventions, they were more likely to show re uh, reductions in um, uh, agitation and similar uh, behavioral symptoms uh, compared to a control group who just got elevator music piped over the loudspeaker. Um, so there are a handful of these. There aren't a lot, but there are a handful of these that um, suggest this is something uh, worth further study. Next slide. And um, in a moment, I'll tell you about Music and Memory, a program developed by a remarkable individual, a social worker in Long Island named Dan Cohen. Uh, and his whole uh, uh, raison d'etre at this point is to bring iPods and other personalized music devices to every person in a nursing home in North America. And he's on his way, and I applaud him. Um, this is a retrospective examination of of facilities that were using music and memory compared to facilities that weren't. And um, this is, again, not a perfect clinical trial. It's not actually a clinical trial at all, not a perfect study. It's looking back instead of looking forward, but it's still very compelling that in the facilities uh, that um, used music and memory, a greater proportion of people experienced a reduction in those behavioral symptoms. And actually more people got to go off of their sometimes dangerous medications to treat these behavioral symptoms. So not a perfect study. Um, we need more studies, but I think pretty compelling uh, evidence to support that uh, everyone who has a loved one with dementia who suffers from behavioral symptoms should think about music as a possible intervention to, to try to treat those symptoms. Next slide. So do we need a dose of music? Um, you know, there's a lot of science we could do around this and I'm, and I'm hoping to do here at UCI. Is music enough? Does it have to be pleasurable music? Does it have to be intensely pleasurable music? Uh, do we need to make the, the hairs on the back of the neck stand up in patients with dementia? Or do we need to activate their nucleus accumbens? Can we even do that in a person who has plaques and tangles accumulating in their brain, robbing them of their memories? A lot of scientific questions that I think are really intriguing, exciting, important, and, and potentially amenable to study here at UC Irvine. Next slide. Even if that doesn't turn out to be true, I think there's a, a lot of other ways music could be helpful for people with dementia. You know, we do a lot of studies in people with, the, with the, these diseases. We ask them to get blood draws and MRIs, and that's hard for patients with dementia in many cases and hard on their, on their, on their uh, family caregivers. Could we use music to try to make it easier to do those things? Could this be a soothing way to help a patient undergo blood draws or get in the brain scanner? Similarly, you know, feeding, bathing, these activities of daily living that people rely on other caregivers to help them complete, can those be supported? Um, the role of music uh, may be great for, for families. Next slide. So I, I try to end all of my lectures um, for the public by, by talking about what I call the three eights. How can you help us in our research to try to rid the world of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias? You can donate, you can advocate, and you can participate. Um, next slide. Um, on this particular occasion, though UCI uh, is in the middle of an important campaign to achieve unparalleled philanthropic goals, I want to say you can also donate to Music and Memory and Dan Cohen's organization that's trying to bring iPods to every person in a nursing home in North America because it's a, it's a noble effort that they are undertaking and they're really doing a great job. They're a fantastic organization. I've been proud to partner with them on a couple of different activities over the years. And, um, and you know, I just hope they succeed. So you might also think about them. Next slide. Um, and if you're interested in participating, uh, we've created a tool called the Consent to Contact Registry or C2C. Uh, actually, the most consistent barrier to curing diseases is low participation in research. And this is a tool that we created that's really low risk. You go online, you tell us about yourself. We refer to it as a dating service. We try to match people with investigators who are doing studies at UCI that they might be eligible for and that might fit their own interests and, and willingness. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to think about whether you might want to be in a study here at UCI. And you can always, um, you're free to drop out at any point from the, con uh, from the C2C. And there's never any obligation to participate when you're approached about a specific study. Next slide. 
So um, I want to thank everyone for their attention. I um, am more than happy to take questions in the five minutes we have left. I'll remind everyone that I'm, I'm told we're going to have a really hard stop. Um, um, but thanks for, for participating in this session. I, I hope that it was uh, interesting. Uh, I hope that you'll think about music differently. And I hope you'll um, think about Alzheimer's disease differently. Uh, thanks again. So if I see any questions in the chat, I'll read them out. I don't know if there's a chance for people to, uh, to do other things. Um, I see raised hands. I don't know if we have the opportunity to call on people. Discussion forum, uh, some kind words, thank you. Happy to take questions until we um, experience that, that click to black. Um, do you think music can be preventative for people whose parents have had dementia? A great question. Um, sadly, no. Uh, I think music activates the brain. I think it um, can help us stimulate. It can help us get us up and moving. I think things like exercise uh, are really important uh, for studies of, of, you know, lowering our risk for, for uh, dementia and, and increasing brain health. Um, but I don't think there's any um, pathway by which we can link listening to music to trying to slow or stop or prevent those changes that we think about in Alzheimer's disease specifically, which are really around a cascade of abnormal proteinaceous events in the brain uh, that result in the formation and accumulation of plaques and tangles. Um, so um, I, there's a question about autism. You know, again, I, I, I have to admit, I don't know the literature about music and autism, but I would um, wonder and expect that music might have uh, similar opportunities as a non-pharmacologic intervention to help uh, people with autism, uh, kids with autism do better in particular scenarios that might otherwise be challenging. Uh, and certainly I think it, it's, a, it's a good idea to try music as an intervention, especially perhaps um, as a preliminary step before you think about medications, which always have you know other risks associated with them, but are often extremely necessary and important. Um, I'm reading these in case people can't see them. Although I enjoy music and listen to it a lot in my 20s, I find as I've gotten older, I listen to much less music. Is that common? Um, I, I think it is um, probably a U-shaped curve. Um, for most of us, that we listen to a lot of music when we're young, and then we get really busy in our adult lives with families and professions and other things, and and that may detract from our ability to listen to music. I certainly uh, am on a, I guess I said a, it should be a, a curve like this, um, uh, a U-shaped curve where we start high, go lower, and then perhaps we can go higher again. I myself used to love to go to concerts and listen to new music and time to do things like that is um, much more scarce uh, in my current uh, uh, stage of life. Um, but as my kids get older and go off to college and uh, maybe when I have less uh, professional responsibilities, perhaps I'll find the time to do more of that again. Um, there is actually, I was just reminding myself yesterday, there's a, an interesting phenomenon whereby some people actually are unable to experience the pleasure of music. It's, it's called musical anhedonia. It's a, again, a very rare condition, um, almost certainly with neurological underpinnings. Um, but so at least if you enjoy music at some point in your life, hopefully you still can, and you'll be able to increase your dose when time permits. Um, 59 seconds to go. And one more question. My parents who both are in their 90s, uh, have dementia, like to watch the same musical movies like Oklahoma over and over again. Besides the music, is there a visual element that might be helpful too? Um, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, possibly. I think what is perhaps most important is if they're um, reliving the pleasure associated with, with the film. Um, and if it improves their mood, then I would definitely keep doing it. Um, I don't know if the visual part has a specific um, benefit uh, from a clinical or medical standpoint. There are um, studies of, of visual training of sorts 
um, but it's more from a cognitive standpoint than simply watching pleasurable movies. Um, so, but I think that the music part might be great and the pleasure part is certainly great. And with uh, four seconds left, I'll say thanks again and enjoy the rest of Homecoming.